So today we are going to see regarding the large intestine. So we know that large intestine is 1.5 meter long and it extends from the PR ileocecal junction to the anal region. So let's see the different parts of large intestine are colon. First it is appendix. Then comes cecum. Then comes ascending colon. We all know that here the organ is existing that is our liver. So this part is called as, this part of colon is called as hepatic flexure. And this part of colon is called as transverse colon. And this flexure of colon, here we know the spleen, organ spleen exists here. So this flexure of colon is called as splenic flexure. So then comes our descending colon. This part is called descending colon. Then comes sigmoid colon. Here it is sigmoid colon. Then comes our rectum. And at last, here comes the anal canal. Okay. So, from here appendix, like this is the ileocecal valve and from here appendix will get started and then comes the cecum which is considered to be the most widest part. Widest and the length of the cecum is 6 cm. Then comes ascending colon which is considered to be the shortest part of colon and the centimeter is 15 centimeter and we know here is the hepatic flexure of colon and then comes the transverse colon this is the longest part and most mobile like this moves very freely without any attachments so transverse colon is considered to be the longest and most mobile part then comes our descending colon which is 25 centimeters sorry i have not mentioned regarding the transverse colon it is 50 centimeter and then comes our descending colon it is uh, 25 centimeter then comes our sigmoid colon which is having the smallest diameter like this is the narrowest part small diameter or you can consider it as the narrowest part sigmoid colon and its length is 40 centimeter length is 40 but it is having the narrowest diameter then comes our rectum the rectum is around 12 to 15 centimeter and then comes the anal canal which is 3.8 centimeter i'm just revising it you just listen for once so first let us start with the cecum diameter of cecum is 6 centimeter and it is considered to be the widest part or it has the largest diameter that is cecum then comes ascending colon which is the shortest part and it is 15 centimeter then comes hepatic flexure of colon and then comes the transverse colon which is the longest and most mobile part and it is 50 centimeter long and then comes the splenic flexure of colon then comes descending colon which is 25 centimeter and sigmoid colon which is considered to be the narrowest part of small, large intestine and it is 40 centimeter then comes our rectum which is 12 to 15 centimeter and anal canal which is 3.8 centimeter so if we are talking regarding the structural adaptation of large intestine it's mainly for storage and absorption of fluids and solutes and here we already know that there is no villi but the mucosa is having the epithelium which is very absorptive in nature and here the lubrication is maintained with the help of goblet cells present in the mucosal layer which uh, maintains the lubrication of large intestine and then regarding the uh, lymphatic follicles here in case of large intestine we are having mainly solitary lymphatic follicles and this helps in protection against the bacteria and other organism. So, now let us discuss regarding the special features of large intestine. First, we are going to discuss regarding the caliber of large intestine. First, it starts very wide in cecum. And once it reaches the rectum, the caliber will get reduced and it becomes narrowed in rectum. So, this is how the caliber of large intestine looks. And then, the second point is regarding the mobility of large intestine. So, according to mobility, all of the uh, most of the large intestine are fixed except a few parts. Appendix, already in above we had seen that transverse colon is the most mobile part of large intestine. So, transverse colon and sigma colon. So, these three parts of large intestine are the 
mobile part and appendix we can guess easily that it is lying next to the uh, cecum and here comes transverse colon which we had already read this is the most mobile part and it is 50 centimeter long and we have to now remember regarding the sigmoid colon which is not having any mesentery attachment and it is really mobile. Okay, now let us see regarding the hastrations of large intestine. So, in case of our dissection or in case of images of large intestine, we had seen this puckered and saculated appearance of large intestine and this is mainly because of uh, the muscular layer present in the large intestine. So, let us see how this muscular layer is contributing to this uh, hastrations in the large intestine. So, first let us start with the innermost layer that is mucosal layer of large intestine. Here, we will be having glands in particular like a, a crypts of Liberkin or intestinal glands will be there which forms the innermost layer of large intestine. This we can uh, see in this image also. So, innermost layer of large intestine which is having crypts of Liberkin. So, then comes our submucosal layer. Here comes our submucosal layer. In case of submucosal layer, we will be having mainly our submucosal nerve plexus that is none other than Meissner's plexus. We can see the nerve plexus here submucosal nerve plexus in case of this submucosal area. So now let us see regarding the muscularis layer. Uh, in case of muscular layer we are having two different muscles. One is thick circular muscle force which is innermost and then comes the longitudinal muscle fold which is very thin that we can see here. So here comes the thick muscular coat interiorly which is circular in shape and then comes the longitudinal muscle coat which is very thin in nature. Then here in case of this uh, muscularis layer we will be having one nerve plexus that is nothing but myentric nerve plexus or arbox plexus that we can see and this myceness nerve plexus and arbox plexus mainly contributes to the entric nervous system and its autonomic responses according to the sympathetic and parasympathetic activity passed over from the brain relay. And now comes the outermost layer that is none other than serosal layer. So, this is how the large intestine looks like. So, let us talk regarding the longitudinal muscle fold. So, already we know this longitudinal muscle fold is very thin in nature comparing to the circular fold and in case of this longitudinal fold, we have ribbon-like structures called, ribbon-like structures called tenia. Don't confuse it with uh, the parasite. Uh, the fungal infections. So, here the ribbon-like structures are called as tenia coli and this ribbon-like structures are, are, are of three types. One is tenia libera, another one is tenia mesocolica and another one is tenia momentalis. So, we had seen how large intestine looks like in cross section. This is how large intestine looks like in cross section. So, here in case of thick muscular layer, circular layer, we will be having this longitudinal ribbon like structures here, here and here all over the large intestine like one is tenia libera, tenia mesocolica and tenia, tenia omentalis. This is how this longitudinal ribbon like structures exist in the walls of the large intestine. So, let us see we had already seen that this is very thin in nature and this is very thick in nature just because of the entanglement of this longitudinal muscle fold in the circular muscle fold there appears this hastrations of large intestine. So, now you can see clearly here comes the circular muscle fold which is entangling the longitudinal thin muscular force leading to this type of hastrations. This is one of the special feature of large intestine. So, now let us discuss regarding the appendices epiplyicae. So, appendices epiplyicae is nothing but the small bags of fat epiplyicae. So, let us see how it is existing in the large intestine. We had seen how the tenia is existing in the large intestine in this manner and the same way appendices epiplyicae usually arise like this. We can see that in the large intestine and it is nothing but small bags of fat which is covered by peritoneum. This so, now let us discuss regarding the special features again. So, first we can discuss regarding the caliber and uh, it was wide in the starting and at the end it become narrowed in rectum. Then regarding the mobility, it is almost fixed except appendix, transverse colon and sigmoid colon. And now we know how hastrations of large intestines are formed because of the uh, thin thin longitudinal coat and thick muscular, thick circular muscular layer and uh, we know what is tenia and now we know regarding the appendices epiplyicae also. So, this appendices epiplyicae present all over the large intestine and uh, there are few exceptions. It is not seen in appendix and cecum. So, here we cannot see this appendices epiplyicae.
So, in case of blood supply, the main supply is through superior mesenteric artery and inferior mesenteric artery branches. So, in case of superior mesenteric artery, it is iliocolic artery, iliocolic, then right colic, then middle colic. In case of inferior mesenteric artery, the branches which were contributing for the left, uh, large intestine were left colic artery and sigmoid arteries. So, let's see how these branches are uh, giving blood supply. So, all these branches get anastomosed to form marginal artery, marginal artery of Drummond. So, this was first explained by Von Hallow, Von Hallow in 1803 and later this was explained by Sudek in 1907. This marginal artery is nothing but arterial arcade. Already we had told that superior mesenteric artery branches were joining. Like all the branches get anastomosed. All these five branches get anastomosed. And this is how the marginal artery arises. This marginal artery is nothing but an arterial arcade. And this marginal artery, at least it is 2.5 cm to 3.8 cm away from the colon. So this marginal artery gives branches to vasa longa and vasa brevia. So, longa is nothing but the long uh, uh, branches and vasa brevia will be arising from this marginal artery and it contributes to the blood supply of the large intestine. So, I am just repeating. Here, first comes the uh, branches of superior mesenteric artery and inferior mesenteric artery. So, in case of superior mesenteric artery, it is iliocolic, right colic and middle colic. Then, in case of inferior mesenteric artery, it is left colic and sigmoid colic. All these arteries get anastomosed to form the marginal artery. So, now marginal artery is nothing but an arterial arcade which is at least 2.5. 5 to 3.8 cm away from the colon. So, in order to give blood supply, there arises the vasa langa and vasa breva, which is contributing to the blood supply. So, let us see how this vasa langa is extending. So, this vasa langa, it divides into anterior and posterior branches and this anterior and posterior branches mainly runs between the serous and muscular layer and finally it pierces the muscular layer and reaches the submucosal area. This is how the blood supply reaches all the layers of the uh, small large intestine. So another one thing which we should know regarding the blood supply of large intestine is watershed areas. So we have two watershed area where there will be poor blood supply because of the lack of anastomosis or poor anastomosis. So first part is splenic flexure of colon. In this area, we will be having the watershed area. So, it is mainly because of the anastomosis, incomplete anastomosis between the superior and inferior mesenteric artery and another one area in the colon that is rectosigmoid colon, rectosigmoid junction that is none other than pseudox point. So, here we will be having the another watershed line. Here, the problem is mainly because of the lack of anastomosis between the inferior mesenteric artery and internal iliac artery. So, this splenic flexure area is also called as Griffith's, Griffith's point. And the problem is mainly because of the incomplete anastomosis between superior mesenteric artery and inferior mesenteric artery. And here it is called as pseudex point. And this problem is mainly because of the incomplete anastomosis between inferior mesenteric artery and internal iliac artery. This you have to remember in particular regarding the blood supply of large intestine. So now, let us discuss regarding the lymphatic drainage of large intestine. First, we are going to see regarding the epicolic lymph nodes which were present in the walls of the gut. You can see it is existing in the walls of the gut. Then, this epicolic lymph nodes gets drained into paracolic lymph nodes which present along the ascending and the descending colon. And from here in the paracolic lymph nodes to the intermediate lymph nodes which presents along the blood vessels. And from here, the lymph is secreted into like drained into the terminal nodes which are presenting near the superior mesenteric artery or inferior mesenteric artery. So, this is how the lymphatic drainage occurs. So, let me explain again. So, first comes the epicolic lymph nodes, epicolic, which is present in the walls of the intestine, that, and from here the lymph drain into paracolic, which is present on the walls of ascending and descending colon, and from here it is drained into the intermediate, intermediate lymph nodes which is present along the blood vessels and from here it is drained into the terminal lymph nodes which are present along the superior mesenteric artery or inferior mesenteric artery. This is the exact lymphatic drain. 
So now let us discuss regarding the nerve supply of uh, large intestine. Here in case of large intestine, we have two embryologically different origin. One is from the mid gut and another one is from the hind gut. So regarding the mid gut, we are having sympathetic and parasympathetic supply as usual. So sympathetic supply is through T11 to L1 segment and parasympathetic is through vagus. And in case of hind gut, the sympathetic origin is through lumbar sympathetic chain that is L1 and L2 segment. And uh, this parasympathetic is through pelvic splanchnic nerve. It's not vagus. It is pelvic splanchnic nerve which is also called as nervous erigentis. So, this is all regarding the nerve supply of large intestine except the lower part of anal canal. So, we will uh, discuss regarding the centric nervous system in some other separate video regarding the action of uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic over the nerve fibre, over the intestine regarding the sensory activity, motor activity and everything in detail. So, now let us discuss regarding the functions of large intestine. So, mainly here comes lubrication part. Feces will be lubricated with the help of mucus secreted by the goblet cells which is present in the mucosal layer. Second function is absorption of fluids and solutes. Absorption of nutrients, everything happens in this say, uh, large intestine. And there comes the third, that is vitamin B synthesis, which appears through the, which occurs through the bacterial flora, which is present in the large intestine. Then fourth point, that is large amount of IgA in the mucus secretion of large intestine, which helps in protection against the any microorganisms. Then last point, or the microvilli, which are present on the epithelial cells, stuffed of epithelial cells, it will act as sensory function. So, this is all regarding the large intestine. So, now let us have some quick recap. So, it is about large intestine and it is 1.5 meter long and uh, first it is appendix, then comes the cecum which is the widest and the and it is 6 centimeter in long and um, then comes ascending colon which is shortest and 15 centimeter, then comes the hepatic luxure of colon, then comes the transverse colon which is the longest and mobile part and it is 50 centimeter long, then comes the splenic luxure of colon, then comes the descending colon which is uh, 20, 25 centimeter long and then comes the sigmoid colon which is the narrowest part and it is 40 centimeter long and then comes the rectum which is 12 to 15 centimeter long and the anal canal which is 3.8 centimeter long long. So, now regarding the special features of large intestine, first regarding the caliber at the origin it is wide and at it, it, and, and the end it becomes narrow and uh, regarding the uh, mobility of large intestine it is fixed and except in case of appendix, uh, transverse colon and sigmoid colon then in case of astrations we know how the astrations are happening because of the longitudinal and the circular muscle folds present in the wall of the intestine then we had talked regarding the appendices epiplyoke then we had talked regarding how marginal artery had been formed and we had talked also regarding the watershed line that is griffith point and the surex point and then we had discussed why diverticulosis occurs because of the weakening of the intestinal wall and lymphatic drainage we had talked regarding the epicolic lymph node draining into the paracolic paracolic to intermediate and intermediate to the terminal lymph nodes and finally nerve supply there are two different embryological origin of uh, large intestine that is mid gut and hind gut mid gut sympathetic supply is through T11 and L1 and parasympathetic through vagus and hind gut sympathetic is through L1 and L2 lumbar sympathetic chain and uh, parasympathetic is through pelvic splanchnic nerve which is nothing other than nervous erigentis and this nerve supply is a exception to the lower part of the anal canal and regarding the functions lubrication absorption and vitamin B synthesis by the bacterial flora which is present in the colon then IgA in the mucosa helps in the protection against the microorganisms or bacterial invasion and these microvilli which are present in the inner uh, wall of the intestine helps in sensory function also and thank you so much.